Hey, we're alive. Great. It's good to be with you this morning. It's lovely to, um, it was lovely to give thanks to Olivia before and for Megan and I to um, dedicate ourselves to the discipleship um, as she grows, hopefully in the love and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we are continuing our series this morning on contagious Christianity, which um, the banners give away. And we've, we're now into four weeks. This is the fourth week we've looked at um, various aspects, what it means to have a contagious faith, what it means to have a contagious heart. And last week, as uh, Rich shared with us, what it means to have contagious relationships, relationships where we can bring people to Jesus. And this morning, I want to look at what it means to carry a contagious story. The whole heart of what we're, we're looking at with this contagious um, Christian series is how do we give away the good news? How do we share this wonderful thing that we have? How do we live lives which are full of joy and excitement? How are we known as Christians for what we are for rather than what we are against? And so that when people look at our lives, they go, wow, there is something different about that person, which I want. I want to catch it. I want to get what they have. That's the invitation that Jesus offers us, and that's the life we are invited into. The question is, are we living that life? And before we go any further, how about I pray? God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we can be together. And I ask and pray that our hearts will be opened. Maybe some of the things that we hear today will be new. I pray that we'll be open to hear them and that you will uh, be just at work amongst us in our hearts and lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, I don't know about you, maybe I'm slightly uh, morbid, but every now and again I, I kind of imagine what my funeral will be like. Do you ever have that? You know, you kind of imagine you're having an out-of-body experience and you're hovering over. Maybe it's just me. Um, I, I do have issues. Um, and, you know, you're kind of hovering over as people gather to, 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 you know, to remember the death of Andrew Serkham and there'll be tears of, of, of sadness, but there'll also be laughter as they remember great stories of this wonderful life. <laughs> how, how he impacted many uh, and maybe, and then I realised that, you know, wow, that's, that's really not me. You know, all these wonderful stories, that's actually not where I'm at. But the question is, what is your story? What is your story? If indeed you were at your own funeral, what would be the story shared of your life? I haven't been to too many funerals. I've been to some that have been quite small. I've been to be part of funerals which have been large as, as people have shared the amazing impact that, of what this or that person has done, the lives they have impacted. But maybe think for yourself, what is the narrative of your life? What is the story of your life up until this point now? One question I want to ask you is, will it be marked by a relationship, a transformational relationship with Jesus Christ? Something that people have seen. There is something about you which speaks of life transformation that comes by knowing this person, Jesus Christ, just as we heard from Paul. And if it isn't, may I suggest there's two things that's going on. One You've forgotten the story. You've forgotten your story. You've forgotten what it was like when you first came to that, that place of recognizing that, that your sins, your brokenness was forgiven and taken away by the love of the creator God worked out in Jesus Christ. You've forgotten the joy that it was when, when you made that decision and your life was turned upside down and you began to think differently and behave differently. Things have gone cold, and so now those memories have gone, and, and the joy has gone. And so the story doesn't trip off your lips. 
you've forgotten. And today I want to remind you the amazing truth, the life transformational truth that perhaps you have experienced in coming to know Jesus Christ. Or maybe you haven't ever come to a place of knowing Jesus. Perhaps your life has never been transformed and changed. And today maybe is your opportunity to come into a relationship with the life-transforming person of Jesus. The Jesus that Paul talks about in his story. So the first thing I want to say as we continue is to say that we are encouraged to live our story. We see this with Paul. If you want to keep your Bibles open and turn to verse 6 and 7. He says to the king of Agrippa, in verse 6, And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I'm on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that the Jews are accusing me. Now initially that doesn't sound really exciting. You know, Paul is under arrest and he is being accused. But let's look at why he is being accused because that is the reason, or well, his life, his living of the story is the reason why he is in chains, why he has been arrested, but why he is now sharing his story. Because Paul's life provokes questions. I don't think Paul went out and thought, right, I'm going to be really, really controversial. I'm going to really provoke people so they hate me. I don't think that was his objective. And I don't think that should be your objective either. I know some people like that. It's a bit strange. The reason that he was being so provocative in the eyes of the Jews was because of the amazing transformation that had taken in his life where he once was the top of the, the top in the religious kind of circles in Judaism, as he says, but how he had met, encountered this person, the Lord, Jesus Christ. And amongst other things, his life had been filled with a new purpose and a new hope. And so he says twice, it is because of my hope, in verse 6. And then King Agrippa in verse 7 is because of what? This hope that the Jews are accusing me. Paul lived out a life filled with hope which provoked a response. The question is, are our lives filled with life and hope that provoke a response? I don't want to go too much into this because Rich talked a bit about this last week and, and Rod did as well when we talked about a changed heart. It's a funny story of a, a colonel during the Gulf War who um, was out uh, in the Gulf and who was having his, his office built. It was kind of a makeshift office and it was still being um, renovated and he was in his office and he noticed that coming towards his office was a private with a tool bag and he, uh, he thought, right, so he picked up a phone and just kind of began to, to say, yes, General Schwarzkopf, yes, I, I think that's a wonderful plan. Yes, yes, okay. Well, thank you for checking. Thank you. Okay, bye. And obviously the, the private had walked in with his toolbox and he looked up and he said, oh, yes, private, what can I do for you? And the, the private sheepishly kind of looked up and said, uh, I, I've come to fix your phone. <laughs> We kind of, we, we don't like inauthenticity, do we? We don't like fake. I think a lot of us are cynical um, of politics and media and, and even religion where, where things are spun at us and that, that it's inauthentic because it's not real. We see through it. We see the lives behind the words and they're not real. They're fake. And so the, the challenge for us, for us is, is to live a life that's authentic, to live out a life which is provocative because it's, we, we practice what we preach. We do what we say. That we're not hypocrites. 
And it's when we do that, when, we, when our lives match up with our words, that our lives become provocative. They, sh- they should be, they must be. So in the workplace, with your friends out at the pub, wherever you are, there's something different about you. You don't say certain words, you don't engage in certain jokes. Your life is different. Why is that? Our lives sh- should provoke a response. And, and when those questions come, when those statements come, guess what? That's an amazing opportunity to share your story, to tell your story. Well, well, why, why am I different? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you why I'm different. Because something happened in my life which has transformed me. Something has happened in my life which has changed me. I, have, I am a different person. It's not about rules or religion, about how I should do things, but something inside has changed me. And I want to live differently. And our words and our actions must be the same because then our stories have power to them. Paul's story had power to it because it was real, it was living. Stories have power because they are us. People can disagree with philosophies and ideas and, and, and all of that. We can debate that and you can argue that till the cows come home. But someone's life story, you can't argue with that. Your story, you can't argue with that. And so it's really interesting that Paul, a hugely intelligent guy, who knew the deal, he, he knew how to debate philosophically. We see a few chapters earlier in chapter 17, he goes to Greece and he engages with the top philosophers and he engages on their level and he speaks philosophically about this person, Jesus Christ, the God with no name, Jesus. Paul can do that. But when he stands before King Agrippa, he doesn't choose to go into philosophical dialogue. And he could have. He recognises that King Agrippa knew the nuances of the Jewish faith and the Jewish law. He knew the controversies and the things that were hot, the hot topics of the day. Paul could have engaged in that level. But he didn't. He chose to tell his story. He chose to tell his story. And with that came power, it came authority. And so your story, when it's if it's real, has power and has authority. What is your story? What is your story? Tell your story. Tell it like you mean it. Tell it because it is true. Tell it because it has changed your life. My story was I, um, I remember one night sitting on the floor of my bedroom and, and looking out at the mess of my room and the chaos and, and realising I just couldn't go on like this anymore. Life had just got out of control. And so at the age of four, (laughs) I bent my knee and became a Christian. I do actually remember, um, I do remember it's one of my first memories sitting one evening with my parents and I think one of my brothers and sisters and saying, I want to be a Christian. I want to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. I probably didn't know all the the massive grand details of that, but I knew enough to know that Jesus loved me. And I knew enough to know that I needed him. What's your story? I want to invite Nicole to come up the front. Uh, Big hand for Nicole. Because... Actually, can I grab a microphone? Because one of the things that we can do is we can share stories together tell our stories to encourage the, um, the fact, actually you can hold on to that yeah, yeah you can and so it, it's good to hear testimonies and stories and I'd love just to, to get Nicole to share a little bit of her story her testimony of her journey before faith coming to know Jesus and, and what that has done in her life so do you want to 
share a little bit? Um, I was born to two alcoholic and drug addict parents who divorced when I was four. And then my mother moved in with a man that would verbally and physically abuse me until I was 16. And then I moved out. And it was at this time that I felt I had no worth, no value, no hope, and didn't see any point to much of my life. And then um, the only thing, probably throughout those years, that ever hit me as love or compassion was a church that I would go to every once in a while just to get involved in their youth group. But I didn't know God. I just know, I knew that I enjoyed those people and the love and compassion that I felt there and the warmth that I felt there, but I still didn't know God. Um, when I was 16, I met a friend who's my best friend still, and she brought me to her church. She was the one person that saw my struggle and my pain, and um, she brought me to her church, and I've never known love like that and compassion and warmth, and I think it's there. I was introduced to Jesus Christ. I became baptized. I found out what hope was, which at that time in my life was definitely something that I needed to be able to go on. And Jesus Christ is hope. And I learned that. I would like to say that my life completely turned around at that time, but it didn't. I still had a lot of struggle. And it wasn't, if I'm honest, until two, about two years ago in March that I could give every part of my life to God every hurt, every pain, every struggle, every ounce of self-consciousness, um, low worth, and I was able to forgive the person that abused me for so long. And I still see him to this day, but I have love and compassion for him, and I know that that could not happen without having Jesus Christ in my life. Hmm. And now, I've, I wanna say three months after that realization and forgiving that man, I met my husband who we just got married last November. But I never thought that could happen. I never thought I could be loved by somebody like that or that I could love somebody like that and trust somebody so much. And again, if I did not have Jesus Christ in my life, that would not happen. And it was the first time that I've actually known peace, complete peace in my life, knowing that God was right there, right with me, holding on to me, and that he had my entire life in his hands. Hmm. Thank you, Nicole. Amazing. Thank you. That's, that's the story of redemption and salvation that we want to share. And as Nicole said, when we come to a, into a relationship and know the love of Jesus Christ, it isn't just necessarily a bang that's everything's bright and happy and good as Christians we go through struggles and we go through a journey of, of learning and growing but what we do know is that we are held safe and secure in the knowledge that we are loved by God and so finally we attach our story to the great story the great story that is the story of God and his redemption plan for us. Donald Miller um, said that uh, a great story is about a character who wants something and overcomes conflict to get it. And great stories, they have common structures, don't they? There's life in its normality, in its mundaneness, in its hardness maybe. Something goes wrong, and then there's an impossible challenge to overcome it. There are mountains to climb which seem unachievable. But then something happens, there's an act of redemption. And then, hopefully, fundamentally, there's a resolution. I don't know if you find this with movies. You think of the great, great, you know, great epic movies, Lord of the Rings. There's loads in that, but, you know... One example is Gandalf as he falls to, to fight Belrock the dragon so that his friends can get away. Star Wars, right at the end, when Anakin Skywalker gives up his final bit of energy to save his son Luke from the Emperor. 
There are many others. I'm sure you have your favourite movies. And I'm sure if you look deep enough, they probably have themes of redemption. Paul himself finds his story in the great story of redemption. In verse 22 and 23, he says, But God has helped me to this very day, so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, framing his story within the story of Israel, that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would suffer and, as the first to rise from the dead, would bring the message of light to his own people and to the rest of the world. We see in the Bible, the Bible contains this story. The Bible, we think sometimes we, we look at this Bible and you might look at it and go, it's a complete irrelevance. The story's from thousands of years ago and they mean nothing to me. You may think that they're just a whole bunch of rules and moral codes that it's impossible to live by and there are people who are trying to do it but not very well. But let me tell you, the Bible is, is not about moral code. It's not just a bunch of fanciful stories that never really happened. The Bible is the great story of God's generous, initiating relationship with us and our often inadequate response to that love. That is the great story. And the great story finds its pinnacle in the coming of the Messiah, as Paul mentions, as he talks about, Jesus Christ, who in a great redeeming act, comes and dies for us. It's a great story. But in our culture, we're sometimes suspicious of such great stories. These overarching stories which determine our lives. We become cynical and suspicious. We see such stories as abusive or aggressive or violent. P political agendas worked out. Religious agendas worked out. Whatever it might be. But can I say that, that actually when we find ourselves in the generous story of God, then we find life and hope. We are redeemed. The story, the great story, we are created by God. However, we fall. You may have heard of it, the fall, where our first parents, Adam and Eve, chose to reject the goodness of their creator God. Walked away and said, you know what? We know better. We're going to do it our own way. And maybe that's your story. You think that you're in control, you're in charge, you're proud. You think that you can do it. Well, the reality is you might for a time, but things tend to fall apart. So we get distracted. We have things in our lives which we ultimately give our time and our resources to which fail us. Relationships, money, a career. All these things we think are our great hope. That's what we put our life into. We say no to the Creator and say we don't need God. In fact, we're going to reject you. We don't even believe in you. You can do nothing for me. So the, the story continues of, of humans trying to reach God but failing because it's in their own strength, failing because they, they can't. They're in a web of sin. Until Jesus Christ comes, breaks into history, God himself choosing to humble himself into our world. The word became flesh, to use technical language. God moved into the neighbourhood. He lived as one of us, but he lived a perfect life. And as you may know the story, he died the perfect death so that we may know forgiveness. So our striving and our effort and our failure and our brokenness could be carried by Jesus at the cross once and for all. But that's not the end of the story because Jesus rose again and he is coming once again. He has defeated sin and death and he is returning one day as Lord. And all of creation will be renewed and restored. 
That is the great story. And we find ourselves in that story. Our lives are changed. Our lives are redeemed. Our lives are filled with hope as we heard stories like Nicole. Maybe your story. Or maybe you don't have that hope. Maybe you're still not sure about where you stand in the great story. Let's go back to the scene of the funeral. What is your story? And more importantly, when it is your funeral, you'll be someplace else. When you stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, what will be your answer? We know that Jesus will judge the living and the dead. We will stand before him one day, and what will be your answer? You see, for Paul, when he stood before the king of Agrippa, what was his answer? His answer was Jesus. He was the Messiah. Then I asked, Paul said when he was confronted with this blinding light, who are you, Lord? What will be your answer? Will it be Jesus? Will it be Jesus? Because that is the theme of the Christian story. That should be the great hope, the great joy of your story. And if it isn't, maybe you need to be reminded this morning. Maybe you need to go back and remember. Remember your first love. Or maybe you have never, ever come into a place of saying, this whole Jesus thing, I I don't know. I, I don't know what I would say if I stood before my Creator. And today... It's the day when you need to come, as Paul did, and say, Lord, Lord, I need you. I am broken. I'm not in control. I need to be saved. Shall I pray? God, I thank you for the power of stories I thank you that they, they are real. I thank you for my story. I thank you for the way in which you have continued to change me. That you are continually at work in me. Reminding me of my first love. Reminding me of what you have done for me so that I might be free. Free and secure to live for you. Thank you for the life that that leads to, the exciting, joyful, full of hope life. And I pray that we will be reminded of that today, that we will step into the life-giving hope that is offered in Jesus Christ and the great story of redemption. In Jesus' name, amen.